please be seated and uh, your lunch will be delivered to you and Dr. Lee will begin his lecture and Gloria take some pictures and so that we know we'll upload Dr. Lee's pictures. Dr. Lee, let me introduce him. Dr. Lee is, uh, <clears throat> he got his uh, BA and MA in political science and diplomacy. Uh, uh, was it the same in the BA and MA? Yes. Yes. In, from Yonsei University, the famous university. Uh, and then he received a PhD in political science from the University of Texas at Austin. This is, you, if you know, that's a famous school. He served in the Korean army as an instructor of international relations and military English. Oh, okay. At the Korean Third Military Academy. At the, and then he was a research fellow at the Sejong Institute, Korea, an Institute of Maritime Strategy Center for Free Enterprise, etc., etc. He was lecturer at the lecturer at the Seoul National University, Yonsei University, Korea University, Sukmyeong University, etc., etc. So I'm not going to go through the whole thing, and uh, probably you, many of you know Dr. Lee already through his uh, lectures that you can easily uh, <coughs> meet through the uh, YouTube's. All right, Dr. Lee, please give us all the things you know. <laughs> Teach us. In, in, in one hour. <laughs> yes, in a, one hour. <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me to this such a fine church, Seoul Union Church. And I also would like to thank my Lord for bringing me uh, here in this very precious place in this afternoon. Uh, Dr. Ko gave me one hour, uh, 42, 45 minutes for lecture and 15 to 20 minutes for uh, question and answer sessions. Uh, my topic today is Israel and the Hamas war, or the Israel and the Arabs, Jewish or Arabs, wars in the Middle East. And I would like to divide my lecture into five parts. Uh, according to the issues, okay, I bring my, okay. Can I turn, yeah. The five sessions, five, five, five parts, or oh, I only write four parts. The first part is world peace. Uh, Reverend Ko mentioned that peace is the most important thing for our personal life as well as the life of the earth the international relations, world politics. But even though peace is the most precious thing, but it's very difficult for us to get one. We have no peace. We have no peace in the world. So it's a little paradoxical. Uh, peace is very important, but why is not a good thing? But we have many wars and very few peace. You know that every war, even it is very short, has its own name the Six-Day War, 100-Year War, Korean War. But long peace does not have its own name. Do you think that we have long peace in world politics ever? Yes, many scholars said that there were long peace after the Second World War. So after the Second World War, the United States became the only superpower and the United States can maintain the long peace for about 40 years without any big fighting with the, with, uh, among the great powers. But that period do not has, does not have any names. So it's paradoxical. The second part, origins and the histories of the war in the Middle East. You know how long they fought in the Middle East? Uh, more than 4,000 years. More than 4,000 years. The third part, Codes of the Israel Hamas War 2023. The origins and the codes are a little bit different. 
origins include histories, but causes means the immediate reason why they fight a war now. So causes of war, the third part, and the first part, the United States and the Middle East. The United States is the greatest country, the most powerful country in the world. They are something like a policeman in the street. They can make peace, but sometimes they do not do their work very well. So there is no peace in the world. Now, you know that uh, President Biden, uh, he makes some mistakes in the past few years. And I think that uh, Hamas and the Iranians despise President Biden and they are doing bad things now. So uh, my lecture is divided into four parts and the first one, uh, why the peace. Uh, political scientists usually uh, cite this very famous maxim of the Roman Romans. If you want peace, prepare for war. Uh, in the Romans, si bis pacem parabellum. If you want peace, prepare for war. If you want A, then do B. But A and B is just the opposite thing. One is war and one is peace. If you want peace, then prepare for war. It's very unnatural, illogic, but this logic dominates the spheres of international politics, world politics. So if you want peace, prepare for war. There are many kinds of peace. Dr. Go mentioned that peace of mind is the most important. But sometimes the slaves, slaves, the lower peoples even have a peace. If they can, if they submit everything to their higher person, to their also. So, two types of peace. One is peace through strength. It's a peace with justice. Because I have, a, I have a power, they cannot despise me. So I, I feel peace. And it is just, it is a peace with justice. But when a big man, when a powerful man calls me, I have nothing but to submit. So in that case, I can have peace. But that peace is not the real peace. So we mean peace only when, it is, we, when that has justice. And the justice, justice, peace with justice is only possible in this human world uh, through strength. So we do not like the peace through submission. It is the peace of the slaves. Uh, we do not want the slave, sl uh, peace of the slaves. So it is paradoxical. Uh, peace and war is just the opposite. But you, if you want to war, if you, uh, if you want peace, prepare for the opposite of war. Uh, one day, very famous British scholar, uh, he was so famous and he got the title Sir, Sir Michael Howard. He is, he was, he was, he was, he was dead in 2019. Uh, Michael Howard once mentions in his very famous book, uh, Studies in War and Peace. It was written uh, in 1971, 52 years ago. Uh, in his book, I found a very, uh, very striking, impressive sentence. I, I want to read that. War, thus in itself, inescapably, is an evil. War is not a good thing. War is an evil, inescapable. Even though everybody justifies their war, war is evil in escapably. But those who renounce the use of force find themselves at the mercy of those who do not. In the past years, the South Korean president, Mr. Moon, uh, he denounced the use of force. Yeah. So it's like the Koreans just a few, few years ago, find themselves at the mercy of those who do not. Those who do not means North Korea, Kim Jong Un. Uh, he he will he never ever uh, surrender to use military force for national unification. Uh, 
Uh, he mentioned every time that I can unify this country with the military force. So uh, in the past few years, South Koreans uh, who renounce the use of force find themselves at the mercy of those who do not. So we were in the mercy of Kim Jong-un's hand in the past few years. Another very famous scholar, uh, he is from Australia. Uh, he was now 93 years old. He also was a very famous uh, historian and political scientist studying international conflict. Uh, that book was our textbook when I studied in the United States. That's, that book is very paradoxical, very surprising. We, every, most of, the majority of the political scientists believe this. But he, in this book, he writes that that's, that, that's not right, that's wrong. Uh, usually, we think the balance of power between the adversaries can maintain peace. If I, if I have power about 100 and my enemy, he has power about 100, we cannot fight. But in this book, that's not true. If you have 500 power, if you have power which can be major than 500, and you, if your enemy has only 100, then there will be peace. Which one is right? Balance of power make peace or imbalance of power make peace? Yeah, imbalance of power is more peaceful than the balance of power if we look, if we look at the history of the international system and the international warfare. When there is one big power, there was peace. So when the Romans were the most powerful country, there was peace. So the scholars said that time as Pax Romana. When Great Britain has the enormous power, nobody can, can dare to fight against Great Britain. Great Britain was the dominant power. When they were dominant, there was peace in the world and we call it as Pax Britannica. And when the United States is dominant, when the United States is the only superpower, then there will peace, and we call it Pax Americana. So he said that in his book, the imbalance of power means peace, and the balance of power rather means the frequent fighting. Now we have two wars going on. The one is Ukraine war, and the other is war in the Middle East, the Israeli war. Another very, it's a very interesting novelist uh, lived in the later part of the 18th, 19th century in France. He once looked at the past histories very in, in detail, and he found 80, 80 8,000 peace treaties, 8,000 peace treaties from 1,000 1, to 500 BC before Christ to 1860 AD. Uh, he's a very intelligent man. <laughs> he found 8,000 peace treaties. And when the peace treaties were, were signed, each one supposed to secure permanent peace, and each one lasting on an average two years. Uh, we have 8,000 peace treaties before 1860. Every peace treaty failed to, to prolong peace. Uh, just the two years is, was the average year the peace treaty can make peace. Uh, another interesting paradox. Uh, he is a very famous scholar in international relations, and he is in Yale University. Uh, there are two countries which has peace treaties, and the two countries which do not have peace treaties. Who has the higher probability to fight a war? Peace treaty, a country with its own peace treaty has a far higher rate of fighting a war against the other country. Do you know why? Why a country with peace treaty fights more open? If Mr. Go, Dr. Go 
is a country A and me, country B. If we do not have any reason to fight, we don't have any reason to make a peace treaty. That's the reason why. So country with peace treaty means that they are going to fight very soon, not now, but very soon. So last government, Moon Jae-in government, tried to make peace treaty with North Korea. If we make peace treaty with North Korea, then what will happen? Then North Koreans ask us to withdraw American troops from the Korean Peninsula. We have peace treaty together. So why you maintain American forces, American troops in South Korea? They must go. After the U.S. troops go out, then there will be a higher probability of war between South and North. So very interesting findings from Bruce Rosset. It is actually this is normal, but we think this is abnormal. This is paradoxical. So peace and war is a paradoxical thing. Uh, you know that Israelis and the Arabs has a fine peace treaty. Uh, they make one good peace treaty in 1993. It is called Oslo Treaty. Uh, even though that was signed in Washington, D.C. in the United States, the Norwegian people, uh, they initiate the peace between Arabs and the Israelis. So that peace treaty is called Oslo Treaty. And due to that treaty, two men got the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, Labin, the Prime Minister of Israel, and uh, ya ya Yasser Arafat, the very famous terrorist uh, representing People's Liberation Organization, Palestine. Palestine. Uh, they both got the Nobel Peace Prize. But after that, there are so many wars. Uh, almost every day, the Palestinians fire a missile, well, uh, some, some missiles to, to Israeli land. Just three weeks ago, that was the huge, huge attack. So that becomes war. But some small conflicts always existed since the peace treaty. So you know who she is? Only, uh, only one Israeli prime minister since its independence in 1948. Uh, she was a prime minister when Arab nations were dominated by foster generals at the time. Uh, when she was the prime minister of Israel, Egypt has a foster general president. Pakistan also has a foster general president. But at the time, she can maintain peace. Nobody there can attack Israel uh, in, her, in her term as Israeli prime minister. She mentioned very impressive, impressive uh, sentences. If the Palestinians lay down their weapons, there will be peace. If the Israelis lay down their weapons, there will be a massacre. So we can distinguish which part is wrong and which part is good. If we lay down arms, there will be massacre. If they will lay down their arms, there will be peace. If North Koreans lay down their nuclear weapons, there will be peace in the Korean Peninsula. If we lay down our weapons, then there will be war in the Korean Peninsula. So we have, it's not very difficult to choose which side is, which is the right side of history. I think the Christians, the South Koreans, Israelis are now in the right side of history. Palestinians are not. Hamas is not in the right side of history. We Jews have a secret weapon in our struggle with the Arabs. The secret weapon is that we have no place to go. Nowhere to go. That's, so that's the reason why Israeli soldiers fight so well. 
And this, she once mentioned this very, also very heart, heartfelt, uh, mind-boggling. Uh, we can forgive the Arabs for killing our children. We cannot forgive them for forcing us to kill their children. We will only have peace with the Arabs when they love their children more than they hate us. This is the, this is the reason why there are so many wars between Arabs and the Israelis. Arabs always attack first, and Israel always respond. But you know that there are four big wars just before this war. So this war can be uh, mentioned as the fifth Arab-Israel war uh, by the international relations scholars. The four wars, all four wars were waged by the Arab people, and all four uh, Israel got the victory. The next part, origins. I mentioned that the origins of war between the Arabs and the Israelis is more than 4,000 years old. More than 4,000 years. You know, when the war first came out in the Bible, uh, the Genesis chapter 14, in that the, the first war comes out in Genesis 14. Uh, the small kingdoms fight at the Sittim Valley. Uh, it was before Christ 2150. Uh, so 4,000 years ago, even at that time, there were very severe wars. But due to that war, the Israelis, Jews, have to fight a war. Uh, in that fighting, the northern, northern countries uh, crushed the five allies. Uh, in five allies, Sodom and Gomorrah were included. And in Sodom, Abraham's nephew lived there. And the northern four armies got him as the prisoner. So, Abraham, uh, Abraham made 318 soldiers. Uh, actually, they were the people working for, they, they were the boys, boys and men working for Abraham, and he trained them as a soldier, and only 318 attacked the northern, northern army and saved the Lord. This is the first war uh, written in the Bible, the first Israeli war. Abraham is the father, a grandfather of the Israeli people. So he fights the war with the other people. Maybe they are the Arabs. Uh, the first war came out, uh, BC 2115. And both, I already mentioned that, which, we, which side we have to support? We, we, have, we have to support Israel, I mentioned. But it is not my own choosing. It is not my international political, not from my knowledge from international politics. It is from the Bible. And I got this from watching the TV channels very few days ago. This man. This man is Mike Huckabee. He is a reverend. He is a politician. He was the governor of Arkansas. And he also, uh, also ran for the Republican candidate for American presidential election with <coughs> Donald Trump. Uh, he quit the race and he asked his supporters, uh, your, your vote should go to Donald Trump. And his daughter, uh, his daughter, uh, Mike Sanders, Sanders Huckabee, uh, she is now the, the first woman governor of Arkansas. Uh, she, I, think, I guess that someday, sometime after, she may be a good president for the United States. But she, uh, he, uh, several days ago, in an interview with the Fox News channel, 
to acquiesce to him. What side we should we should be in? What side we have to support? It's naturally, it's of course, we are for the Israelis because it was written in the Bible. The reason is because it was written in the Bible, we have to support the Israeli people. Uh, Genesis, 12, Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So, Bible clearly mentioned that we have to support Israel now as, a, as a Christians. We should support Israel. They are fighting for God, and God gave them blessings. So, it is, we have no doubt. There cannot be a debate as a Christian. So, this man is Abraham. I know that it's a correct picture, but uh, God makes a covenant with Abraham. Uh, and it, he is about 350 years younger than Noah. Uh, after Noah, 350 years, Abraham was born, and God chose him uh, as his man. And you know the, how God gave the Israeli people the land? It was also written in the Bible, clearly written in the Bible. I will give this land to you from the river in the Egypt and to the great river in Euphrates, the Euphrates river, saying, or to die. Uh, from the river of Egypt here, this means Nile, onto the great river, the river Euphrates, here. So these are the land God gave to the people, the descendant of Abraham. So is the Arab people the descendant of Abraham or not? They are also the descendant of Abraham, uh, even though the lineage are a little different, Hagar, not Sarah. Anyway, Arab people also has the right to live there. The Philippines, uh, Palestine, and the Israel war, the first mentioned in the first Samuel, chapter 7, verse 8. And the people, Israeli people gathered at Mizpah, Mizpah. And they pray, they pleaded Samuel, please pray for us. The, the topic, the issue of the prayer is that uh, he will save us out of the hand of the Philistines, Palestine people. At the time, Palestine was the stronger than the, Arab, the Jewish people, and the Jewish people gathered t together at the prayer meeting at the Bispa and asked, plead. Uh, Samuel, uh, pray for, pray for them. Uh, it's a very famous story. Uh, David and Goliath. Uh, Goliath, you know how tall he was? Uh, he was two meters and six centimeters tall. Two meter. I'm one hundred and sixty-seven. 40, about 40, 40 more centimeters taller than I am. Uh, and for 40 days, Israeli soldiers here, Palestinian soldiers there. And for 40 days, two times a day, he came out and cried out to the Israeli people, we do not fight all together. Just come, one man come out, fight with me. And if you win, you win. And if I win, we will we win, uh, but because he was too big and too looks too powerful, and nobody dared to fight against him. You, we we know the story very well. One day, a very small boy, uh, the youngest boy of Ise, uh, came to came to the battlefield not to fight, but to give their brothers food. And he heard 
that what he mentioned that day, and he said that to the king, Saul, I will fight him. I will fight him. And the king Saul said, you are too young, uh, and you are not a soldier. You cannot fight him. But he said that I am the fighter of God. I, I can fight him. I can kill the lion. I can kill the wolves. Then I can kill him. He is lion and wolf. I can kill him. So the Saul gave him some military uniforms, military wears, and it's not good for David. And he threw them all away. And he has only three weapons. The one is stick. The other is the pebbles, small stones. And the other is a sling, only three weapons. And he met him, and he used the sling and killed him. I'd like to read some very famous sentences. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then we will be your servant. But if I prevail against you, against him, and kill him, then shall we be our servants and serve us. So game was over at this sentence. Goliath mentioned to Israelis, if you win over me, then you will win, and I will be your servant. And at the time, Israel won the war against Goliath. The game over, game set. And another very famous sentence, for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hand. Reverend Go mentioned that nobody can solve this problem. Only God, God's intervention can solve this problem. And we have to know which side, uh, God, which side <coughs> is God's side. Every nation has the pastors and the monks in their army as an officer. So during the war, the officers, religious officers, pray God, God, please give us victory. But this part, for, for example, German soldiers, German, German officers praying God, please give Germany victory. The British soldiers also had the same prayer, same prayer. Then. How can God choose the victorious side? Germanists also pray very, very loudly, and the British also said the same things to God. Which side is mine? So I read that from Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln prays every day during the Civil War. And he said that, I pray God that I should be all the time in the side of you. I do not ask you to give us victory. I ask you, I will be in your side all the time. So God chose to choose somebody who is in his side to be victorious. And sometimes we, we do not correctly know that uh, his sling, David's sling, and the sling stone hit and come out, but it's not, that, it's not true. His stone sunk into Goliath's forehead. It is, in Korean, it is bakida, uh, bakida, uh, in, his, in his forehead. You know how, how strong the sling was? Roman soldiers, Roman soldiers has stealing, the sling unit. They are called the slingers. And they are very powerful. So according to military history, a sling could kill a person with one shot. The, to the accuracy and the range in the Roman army, a well-trained bowman, bowman means while in Korean, bowman, was considered equal to an equally trained slinger. Slinger can uh, slingshot regularly, smashing the bones. 
even the soldier wears a wears a iron clad kabod in Korean. Even with kabod, the soldiers their their bones were broken with the slingshot. So another interesting thing, uh, the sling power of the David sling slingshot was like the power of this gun. So even the Goliath have to die if he got this bullet in his forehead. So it's Dr. Goy is an archaeologist. It is proven uh, the archaeological studies proven that the David sling is as powerful as this modern guns. It's David King David, David in Korean. Every Israeli people respect him, and every Israeli politician wants to be him. You know that every Iraqi, every Iraqi president wants to be the Nebuchadnezzar, and every Iranian president wants to be a Cyrus, an Egyptian, uh, Israeli hero is David. When he was the king, he reunited the Jews, conquered all Palestine, and defeated all the external enemies of the Jews. Uh, this is the dream of the Zionist idea. Zionist idea is not fulfilled because uh, Israeli people not yet defeated all the external enemies of the Jews now. Yeah. When David ruled the Israel kingdom, it was the land of David. This is the land of today. Today is Israel. The David's territory was far larger than the territory of Israel today. You know, which island is this? Every Korean knew this island. This is Dokdo Island. Uh, Koreans say this is ours. And the Japanese also say, this is ours. Whose land is that? Korea. Uh, that's Korean land. But what is the reason? <coughs> Koreans sometimes say, according to the history book, that island is ours. But according to the history book, Manchuria was also belongs to Korea, belonged to Korea several thousand years ago. But history does not mean anything in solving this territorial dispute between nations. International law said that that is our land. That's not true. Dokdo is our land. Dokdo is ours because we have now military, military control over that island. That's the reason why. If the Jewish people rule over, have military control over Palestine, that's the Jewish land. If the Palestinians has the military control over that island, then that's Palestinian. Let me see the history to justify my argument. Yes, this is Israel today here, but it was the land of Persia. Uh, this was Israel today. It was the Byzantine Empire's territory for several hundred years. It was, uh, it is, it was Palestine, today is Jewish, Jewish, uh, Israel. It was the land of this country, Ottoman Empire, for more than 400 years. So according to history, that country belongs to the Romans belongs to the Persians, belongs to the Ottoman people. So not, not the Palestinians, not the Israeli people. Uh, this was lasted until 1917. 1917 year was the year when the First World War was almost over. At the time, the enemy of the Ottoman Empire was France and Great Britain. They fought over. And they, at the time, they knew that we are going to win this war. After we win this war, 
we have to divide and rule the Ottoman Empire's old territories. So they, the French and the British for, uh, prime, uh, foreign ministers make a treaty, secret treaty. If we win the war, then this land should be divided by us. So you know that there are many straight lines over here, many straight, straight lines that over the map, they just use the, use the measures to draw the lines. Uh, that's the reason why their territorial line is composed of the direct lines, not the natural border. It's just the artificial lines over here. So Skikes and the Picot, uh, both are the names of the foreign ministers of the late part of the First World War, French and the uh, British. Yeah. After the war, this land was divided like this. The red part belongs to the British. So British got the Israel's territory today. There are many people living in Great Britain, many, many Israel Jewish people. One of the very famous Jewish people is Rothschild. Rothschild provided very uh, much money to British government. And he asked British politicians, please, we are, we'd like to go to Israel again. We'd like to go to Palestine again. That idea we call it as Zionism, Zionism. Zionism is the Jewish people's idea for making their own country, uh, which was provided God uh, through the Bible. At the time, 1917, the same year, British Foreign Minister Balpo, Balpo, uh, his name is Balpo, he promised Israeli people that we are going to uh, make some part of this land. Uh, we are going to give it to you uh, for you to have to build a Israeli nation over there. That's the 1917 Balfour Declaration. But after just 30 years, after the Second World War, the Israeli people finally got some part of the land over there, and they built the nation of Israel, state of Israel. So they are, these people are the very famous for a uh, Zionist movement. Theodor Herzl, uh, he wrote a book in 1896 on uh, Jew Jewish, Jewish state. And he is the first president of the modern Israel. Uh, they both are the very famous leader of the Zionist movement. And Balfour, a British foreign minister who promised Israeli people that we are going to give you some land over there, then you can build a nation. So, in 1947, Israel finally got the land. The blue one is the Israelis, and the yellow one is for the Palestinian people. But if you look at this picture, this, this map, the Israel, Israelis cannot, cannot protect themselves. Uh, if, if the Palestinians cross this, cross this, then Israeli people has a divided country, a three-part country. But fortunately, just the day when Israel declared independence, Arabs attacked Israel, and Israel fought the first war that is called as the first Arab-Israel war. Israel won the war, and they got some more territories. Yeah. To the Israel uh, people there, I would like to introduce some Israeli people's thoughts about that land, that small piece of land, that not very good land, but to the Israeli people, this land is mine. God gave this land to me, this brave and ancient land to me. And when the morning sun reveals her hills and plains, then I see a land where children can run free. This is the meaning of that small land for the Israeli people. 
So they made many good movies and good things. Uh, this is the movie for Exodus. It's a very famous actor, Paul Newman. He's a Jewish. And it was, this song was sung by Andy Williams, also Jewish. Uh, the day when Israel was founded. Israel was founded just three months before the Republic of, of Korea gained independence. Uh, 1948, May the 14th, midnight. Uh, the first nation that recognized Israel as a nation was the United States. Just after 11 minutes, uh, the United States government regarded Israel as an independent nation. And at the time, the American president was Truman. And after the Truman was retired from his presidency, Israeli people uh, invited him uh, to give him thank you. Uh, thank you for your help in making Israel. And at the time, President Truman mentioned that I was not a helper. I was the maker of Israel. I made your country. You know, I am a Cyrus. I am Cyrus. So, so one American scholar wrote a book uh, about his relations with the uh, establishment of modern, modern day Israel. I am Cyrus. Harry S. Truman and the Liberals of Israel. Very interesting book. Uh, after the first war, after the first war, Israel got the land. So it is far easier for Israel to defend their country. This, this military geography means that Israel cannot be defended. But this means that we can defend our country. And another war, 1967 war, is a very famous one. Just six days. But during six days, Israelis got this land. Just this part was Israel, but Israel got Sinai and the Golan Heights and the West Banks. And after, after the war, Israel became a very big country. But Israelis returned this land to Egypt. And after that, Egypt do not fight a war with Israel again. And Gaza Strip, this now, uh, it is also belonging to Israel. But Israel troops come out in 2005. You can live here, but do not infiltrate our country. So they, they built the wall. Uh, but Palestinian people who lived there now make a revolt and attack to Israel. That's the Israel Hamas war today. But my, some, some say that, why you close that door? Look at the Korean Peninsula. If we demolish DMZ, South Korea cannot leave uh, from those Korean infiltration. That, that's why. But Hamas people, Hamas was a, it's not a political party. It's just a fighting organization. So many governments in the world regard them as terrorists while many are not regarded them as terrorists. But the United States, Great Britain, Australia, many Western countries regard Hamas as a terrorist organization. And Hamas is now the de facto, de facto governing body of this, this Palestine. Palestine is divided into two places. One is Gaza and the other is the West Bank. Palestinians who govern West Bank is very, not very friendly to Israel, but they can make peace with Israel, but Hamas cannot. They are the terrorists. Yes, you get this map. Uh, Palestine, two Palestinians. This is Gaza Palestinian, and this is West Bank Palestine. Uh, this part. They are collaborative to the Israeli government, but they are the terrorists against Israel. And I mentioned that there are four wars. First Arab-Israel war, that was broken out just the day when Israel declared independence. And the second Arab war, 1956, <coughs> it was fought with 
uh, French and Great Britain and sided with Israel against the Arabs. And so the Arab-Israel war, just mentioned, six, six day war, and the first Arab-Israel war was the war in 1973, Ramadan war. And now uh, they are fighting the fifth, fifth Israel Arab war. I think that is recorded as the fifth war. Uh, this man. This man is now, he's dead, but the followers of this man is uh, governing the West Bank side of Palestine. And he was despised by the Hamas. Hamas despised him, not their real leader. So this is the president of the West Bank Palestine. The American foreign minister can meet him. They, they can talk together. Uh, this guy, I don't know whether he is dead or not. But yesterday, I heard the news from folks that the head of the Palestinian Hamas head was dead, but I'm not quite sure. Uh, this is the picture you can see from the TVs. Uh, the Israel has an iron dome. You know why it is an iron dome? <laughs> it's not a real dome, but it's just an anti-missile missile. The Israel's missile can target the upcoming Palestinian missiles in the air. So they call it Iron Dome. But that first day, the Palestinians fired 5,000 5, missiles. So some of them hit the Israeli people. And the Israeli people, 1,400 died in that day. If it is the United States, it equals with 50,000 Americans dead in one day. So Jewish people regard that as the 911 for the Israeli people. So we are now fighting against the terrorists, not the normal fighters. Why? Do you know why Israel and the United States are so close? Is there any specific reason? You, anybody, American, can answer the question? Why? Why the United States is so close to Israel? No idea. Uh, in international political sense, that's very absurd. So every country doing foreign policy according to their national interest. National interest sometimes means money, people, land. But Arab is a huge land, huge people, and huge oil. Israel, small land, few people, nothing. But why the United States think Israel far more important than the Arabs. Why? Uh, that's, that's the riddle of the political scientists. We don't know the, the reason why America is a Christian country. The Americans regard them as the new Israel. So Americans identify themselves as, yeah, we are, we, we are same with the Israeli people over there. That's the reason why. So we cannot explain why the United States is so close with Israel. We cannot explain in political science. We just can explain in terms of Bible, in terms of religion. And another, if I uh, look at this, this is a very interesting book, Friends Indeed. This means that, do you know that Korea and the United States signed a treaty. We signed that. So we became an alliance country. We, we became an ally. But between the United States and Israel, there is nothing written down. Nobody says that we are the treaty ally, not because there is no treaty at all. But 
United States and the Israel is the most close friend in the world. There is no more emotional, controversial, enigmatic, or purely dramatic political and strategic alliance in the history of the United States than its relationship with the state of Israel. It's a wonder they do, they, even they do not know. But we have no reason to be close with Israel. But anyway, we, Israel is the most important ally of our country. If the United States president one day said that they are not our friend, the next day he will go on. The next election, <laughs> he has no hope. Israeli people, 46% now living in Israel and 40% living in the United States. They occupy almost every important field in American society. Every fine university, the every very fine uni university professors are from, Ju they are Jewish. Uh, famous music stars, famous singers, famous scientists, Famous Marxist, famous anti-Marxist, everybody is from Israel. Haley Kissinger, very famous American foreign minister, and you know who is the current foreign minister of Israel? Blinken, Anthony Blinken, he is the Jewish. And the National Security Council Chairman of the United States today. His name is Jacob, Jacob, Jeremiah Sullivan. Uh, even though he is not a Jewish people, his name is Jacob, Jeremiah Sullivan. He is now in charge of the White House Foreign Affairs. And the Foreign Minister, Anthony Blinken, he is from Jewish. And when he met Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, he mentioned, he said that, I am here as the, as the Secretary of the United States and also as a Jewish people. That's the reason why the United States support Israel and Israel is true. Lastly, I, the Israel, American support to Israel, this is the Empire State Building after the war. They lit like this. But this is the flag of Israel, blue and white. We support Israel in our full heart. Yeah. The most famous US Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, is Jew, and the current he is also Jew. The American government is dominated by the Jewish people, especially Biden's government is too, same. Almost most important position is occupied by the Jewish people. But he's a little too weak. Weakness on the world stage. So weakness brings conflict. Strength brings peace. When Trump was the president in four years. No war occurred. No war in four years. But in three and two and a half years, two wars already. We don't know whether there, were, there will be war in Taiwan Strait. If the war broke out in Taiwan Strait, it directly affects our life. If, Taiwan, if the Taiwanese conflict lasts three, four months, Korean economy will be fallen down. Completely. Four years, zero wars. And some write a picture very, very meaningful. Somebody is with him for a long time uh, in, his, in his agony years. Uh, he looks like this, this person, Jesus Christ. If we have to have a choice between being dead and pitied and being alive with a bad image, we'd rather be alive and have the bad image. This is the current situation. Every people 
not every people, but so many people protest against the Israeli government. But Israel Prime Minister mentioned this. And now, U.S. China watch this. Is, I read it from Epoch Times. One very famous American uh, American senator from Republican Party, uh, Senator Mitch McConnell, calls China, Iran, North Korea, and the Russia new excess evil. E when the Americans mention some country as evil, that means they are going to destroy them. So Jesus Christ mentioned the enemy. Uh, if you if your enemy speck your cheek, then the other cheek. You you have to but enemy is not different enemy is different from the evil. Evil should be destroyed according to the Bible. So when American government mentions some country as evil that means that I will going to destroy your government, not your nation. I will destroy your government, North Korean government, Iranian government, Russian government, and Chinese government. So it's a very, very important message uh, just came out from the United States. I will finally uh, mention one thing. <clears throat> One man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighters. Do you agree with this? This is the I, I don't like those people I don't like the people who says these words. Palestine is good because Palestine is uh I okay. One man's terrorist, we call Palestine as a terrorist. But that terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. Hamas is a freedom fighter to, some, to, to somebody. How can you distinguish freedom fighter from a terrorist? We have to distinguish it. If we do not distinguish it, that we cannot say fish side is wrong and the fish side is good. Very easy method. Uh, American woman, uh, he, she is very conservative. She said that American president usually mentioned this. Every Islam is not a terrorist. Yes, that's true. Every, every Islam is not a terrorist. That's right. But she replied that. But Every terrorist is an Islam. You know, you know him? His, his name is An jung -un, a Korean independent movement fighter. We call him Uisa, uh, freedom fighter. Japanese call him a terrorist. And we call him freedom fighter. How can we distinguish him how can, what is, An jung is he a terrorist or a freedom fighter? He is a freedom fighter, you know, the reason why. Very, very easy answer. Freedom fighter never kills a woman. Freedom fighter never kills a child. Freedom fighter never kills a old people. Freedom fighter never kills a non-armed citizens. An jung kills the politician who is waging the occupation of the Korean Peninsula. If An jung if he shot a gun against a Japanese world woman who was traveling Manchuria, then he is a terrorist. If he shot a girl, Japanese senior high school girl, who is traveling Manchuria, then he is a terrorist. But he just fights the right target. So he is not a terrorist. We can distinguish terrorist and fight, uh, 
uh, and freedom fight in that way. The last picture. So one airplane with 200 people hijacked in the United States airspace. And that plane is uh, flying to the soccer field, uh, football field. This is the Michigan football field. Uh, if the game open, there are more than 10,000, uh, 10,000? 100,000, 100,000 people gathered together. And this hijacked plane is uh, flying toward this, this area. And one US fighter, jet fighter, find this. And he, this fighter can shut down this airplane. What is his choice at this moment? <laughs> so difficult. So we are now fighting against the terrorists. If we, if he do not kill this airplane, the 200 of the people die anyway, because this is a bomb. And you hit over here, then several thousand more people die with 200 in that airplane. So in that case, the fighter have to shut down that airplane. So the logic of fighting a terrorist warfare is not a normal logic. In this book, I found a very interesting statement. He is the Prime Minister of Israel now. He wrote a book. When you find a terrorist, and you find a terrorist who is eating his lunch, and you have a gun. What you should do? Kill him on the spot. If you capture him alive, because of him, there is another terrorism. Because of him, another terrorism. So it's the best way to kill him now. So terrorist warfare does not apply the law of war. The, the law of war cannot be applied to the terrorist. So law of war, the United States, most power, powerful country, mentioned those Koreas, do not attack us. If you attack us, then you are going to die soon. Mr. Kim, you will die first if you attack us. Through that intimidation, the war can be deterred. War can prevent it. But if Kim, if he is a terrorist, he does not worry about his death, his life. And he anyway attack us. So in fighting a terrorist warfare, we have to search a terrorist and kill him there. So the law of war cannot be applied in this war. But <laughs> Blinken, uh, not Blinken, the Biden asked this person, you should abide by the law of war. So many American anchormans uh, got very angry. What are you doing now? But they are fighting for their survival. But you ask them to follow the law, law of war. What does that mean? So he makes the situation very confusing. So that's the reason why uh, the, I say that the Biden foreign policy is a little bit not very successful in preventing and fighting a war in that area. Okay, <laughs> I can, I, I don't know whether I keep time, but <laughs> if any questions, then <laughs> uh, my, my lecture is, I will stop here. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yes, uh, we do not say anything until now, but we find that the Hamas, Hamas terrorists to fight, uh, fire bomb, fire missile, which was made in North Korea. Uh, that was really, even that bomb, so territorial 
were written, and there was Korean, Korean records. So now we have to take a position, clear position. Yeah, I think that uh, the other countries, the United States, Russia, will join the war at any time. And they have to. And Israel's purpose is to eliminate, eliminate Hamas at once and for all. To do that, they have to wage a big war now. Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, already mentioned that this war will will be last will last for several months, several more months. And if they do not eliminate Hamas, then they will protect protest against them anytime soon. And those Koreans, Iranians, they provide money. And the Biden government think that they can make peace with the Iranians. So when Biden was the vice president, Obama was the president at that time, they make an Iran deal. Uh, but Iranians continuously make nuclear weapons. If now Iranians have nuclear weapons, and if they mention this, Israeli government, if you invade Hamas, if you invade Gaza, then I will shoot you with our nuclear weapons. How can the Israelis do in this situation? So now I think that Israelis will going to destroy Iranian nuclear facilities very soon. If they do not do that, they are going to die. They, they have nothing to do with the nuclear blackmail from Israel. So when it was about 20, 30 years ago, when Saddam Hussein of Iraq, Israelis confirmed that they are going to make nuclear weapons. And the Israeli fighters, airplanes, went there and destroyed all the facilities at once. So Israelis nuclear pro uh, Iraqis nuclear program was gone at the time. Now Iranians are doing that. Almost 90% completed. So 10% they need to go more than 10% and the time is not enough. So without doing that, let's also the situation I just mentioned. Iranians with nuclear weapons, new Israeli government do not do not take action against the Gaza Strip. If you do that, if we invade that, I will use our nuclear weapons over Tel Aviv, over Sumer. So to prevent this, uh, Israeli government have to do something, and the United States have to support the Israeli government. <laughs> Another question? OK. Um, it's quite interesting and intriguing at the same time. Um, are we on the verge of Third World War? <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, so recently I heard some of the guys from Africa, um, especially Christians actually. Uh, my, my, my thing is about um, the way you explain first how God is involved in the whole formation of Israel nation. Um, in Africa right now, people are saying um, Israel is fighting with bombs, uh, tanks, and missiles, and guns. But for us as Christians, we are praying, we are saying in wars, leave it to God, the God of Israel. Now, the God of Israel is fighting with bombs and attacking and like that. 
we don't do anything as Christians. Right now, today, as Christians, we are supposed to pray. We are praying for the Holy Land, Holy Land of Israel, the land that God himself gave the people of Israel. That's something for us. As Christians, that's something. That's, it means a lot. It means it's, it's so important. How, how then are we taking side? How then are we siding with Israel and leaving the people that God chose? Because the whole, peop- the whole land of Israel, where they are right now, it, it belongs to Palestine, right? And the Israel came in. And right now, I would say, even those Palestines are the same, are, are the God's people, because they are descendants of, descendants of Abraham. So they are the same people. So which side are we supposed to take? Are we, are we, are we supposed to have a side, or we just have to pray for both, Hamas and Israel? <laughs> yeah. You have to ask the question to Reverend God <laughs> rather than to me. Uh, but you know that the Palestine is not the land Palestine lived. Jewish people also lived there for 2,000 years. But usually we know that it was the place where the Palestinians lived for 20 centuries. But suddenly, Israeli people came here and they got the land and this is our land. But that's not true. Israeli people also lived there. Palestinian people also lived there together. And they have no nation. Once they had the Persian Empire, once Roman Empire, Byzantine Empire, Ottoman Empire. And after the Ottoman Empire and the Israeli state, state of Israel was built in just 1947. And at the time, Great Britain and the United Nations provided uh, uh, Palestinian people land. But they do not build their own nation. Israeli built their nations. So it's a very difficult question, but according to, to the Bible, sometimes the very difficult question has a very easy answer. We usually say, which is the first, egg or, egg or the chicken? Chicken is the first, according to the Bible. So according to the Bible, that land belongs to, to the Jewish people. And the Jewish people now suggest that you can make your country over here. We say that as a two-country solution, Palestine here, Israel here, then we can live together. But Palestinian people oppose that idea, not the Israeli people. So what do you want, Palestinians? You go out to the sea. You cannot live here. This is because this is our land. That's not true. That's not true. And every Iranian boys, uh, every Egyptian boys, every Arab boys had a nightmare when they were young. This is the very famous general Moshe Dayan. He waged a 1967 war, six-day war, with a great victory. At the time, every Arab children have a nightmare that Moshe Dayan, with a butcher knife, killed him. One very famous pastor in the United States, uh, Mark Gabriel, Dr. Mark Gabriel, he was an Egyptian boy, and he uh, he changed his religion when he was 34, and his father wanted to kill him. So he, uh, he moved to South Africa and then to the United States. He wrote a book. When I was 10 years old, the year when the Sixth Day was broken out, I had a very terrible nightmare, uh, Moses Dayan, with his knife, come to his room and kill him and he cut down him in part. And that's not only my dream. Every of my friends has the same dream at the time. Here's the last, I, I don't know whether I, I bring it 
over here. This work cannot be ended without the, the intervention of God. Oh, I do not have this. I, I don't have this one. Now, he mentioned that nobody can solve this problem. Only the blood of Jesus can solve this problem. Uh, that's Dr. Mark Gabriel's conclusion of his book, uh, titled as a 2,000-year-old uh, conflict between Palestine and the Jewish people. His conclusion, nobody, no country, no nation, United Nations, U.S., nobody can solve this problem. Only this problem can be solved with the blood of Jesus Christ. So the Prime Minister of Israel, Golda Meir, once mentioned that the, if you love your children more than if you hate us, then there will be peace. So this is not a very difficult question for us Christians. And the Third World War? I don't think so. So when? When the righteous people have courage, then the weak, uh, then, uh, then, then the evil, uh, when, when the right people, righteous people have courage, then the evil lost its power. So we should be a little bit more courageous, especially in this country and in the United States. When Trump was the president, he has a very clear message to, to the world, especially to the Arab people. If you kill one American, then you will be killed. If you kill one innocent people, then you will be killed. But Biden mentions, don't, don't, don't. Biden's foreign policy is don't, don't, don't policy. Israel, please do not this. Arabs, please do not this. Yeah. Uh, yes, Dr. Lee, thank you for coming. Um, you were, you're mentioning just now about a righteous people. They did. It's been shocking for me to see how much hostility and division there is. The protests all around the world. I think, you know, it's um, Sunday here in London. It's Saturday. I think they had more than 100,000 people, yeah, yeah. you know, marching. Um, they did surveys in America this week. Mm -hmm. And generationally... There's a huge divide in America. Yeah. Gen Z, more than half of Gen Zers said that the actions of Hamas was justified. More than half yeah, yeah. of the younger generation said they were justified. Yeah. Harvard, you know, Harvard, Stanford, all the, the universities across the country, they're having protests. And somebody like me, older, that's really, really shocking. Yeah. In this issue, you mentioned righteousness. Um, our young people, our young people in America have, I don't know if they know what the word means. They've been brainwashed, LGBTQ, yeah. you know, there's more than two genders. Same sex may on and on and on. Yeah, sure. We are seeing the fruition of Marxist ideology that's been that's been standard at the universities for decades now. And now it's coming out for all to see and it's really, really shocking. Yeah. I how do we I don't you know, um if you want to step in and take Biden's place, it's okay with me. But I mean, how do we, how do we solve the the real problems in America? Because it's true. Um, I don't like America as as the world's policeman because we have too many problems. But I I do like a s strong country com committed to our core values. But it's just been shocking. Yeah. How do we? 
You're a historian, okay. How do we get out? Is there, how do you get rid of the Marxist infection that's throughout the academy, yeah. the academic institutions? Yeah, that's the problem. In, yeah. So when the Soviet Union was alive and strong, the United States was not that Actually, the Marxism was not there in the United States, even though there are a few Marxists there. Everybody likes the freedom, capitalism. But now, after the Soviet Union is gone, and after China changes economic system into capitalism, the Americans lost the mind that, oh, Chinese socialism, that's OK. That's not, a, that's not the threat to, to us. So only 42% of the Americans support the United, support Israel in this war. But the, prob, the, but the good thing is that the American elite, higher ranking persons, almost unanimously support Israel now. And this is a Fox, Fox Anchorman. His name is Jesse Waters. He was very angry about the American student. And he even mentioned that Hamas as an animal. We are now fighting against those animals. Oh. So actually, this is very, very courageous people. Oh. In, the, in the prime time team, a very famous anchorman mentioned Hamas as an animal. So now, Still, the United States hope we can, if we see these kind of people. And when I was in the United States, it was, 19, it was the early part of 1980s when I was in Texas. Texas was the heart of American capitalism. No Marxist professors there. Even one of our professors who teaches Iranian politics support to Iran, and he every time mentioned that Iranian people is a peaceful people. And at the time, many students unanimous, unanimously speak against him. And he was a pure minority. But in these days, American universities, especially very uh, famous universities like Harvard, Yale, Columbia, so-called Ivy Leagues, they are do dominated by the Marx Marxism. But their act is never Marxist at all. Their idea is Marxist. Marx said that we have to share everything, but they do not share anything. And one good news, you know, LGBTQ, LGBTQ cannot reproduce. Mother is female, father is female, that family has no child at all. So one American demographer calculate uh, the Christians have about three children, the Christian white and the LGBTQ. They can adopt children, but they cannot make children. So after a few generations, 90%, 90%, more than 95% of the United States will be the Christian family. It is not my idea, but Dr. Steve Tolley, who is a very famous, I think he is a theologian, but he is doing some uh, YouTube, he is doing YouTube works in these days. And he mentioned that after several generations, 95% of the American Household is a Christian family. Is that, I don't know whether this not, uh, not not without revival. We need revival for sure, <laughs> right? So now in the United States, one college uh, openly claimed that our university is a conservative university. That's the university, Baylor University in Waco, Texas. Uh, our university is conservative. Some college, Hill State College, uh, they are also the response of the uh, Mark, 
Marxism of the Ivy Leagues. Uh. That college also mentioned that we are for conservative ideology. <laughs> <laughs> I think we uh, spend more than uh, one hour. Uh, this subject is endless. Uh, I think the Palestinians, in my opinion, made a mistake. They didn't have uh, brain to organize their country and make a strong nation. They were, uh, after Oslo, I was in Israel at that time. I want to go to Jordan from Israel. But um, people living in Israel, they, the Jordan didn't give a visa. So I had to went to Egypt to get a visa to go to uh, Jordan. But then when Oslo Agreement happened, then voila, we were allowed to go to Jordan mm. through the Allenby Bridge, the north of the Dead Sea. And so I was the first one, I was in the first group to go to Jordan from Israel. Mm. And since then, uh, the world, including UN and the USA, gave a lot of money to Palestinians to organize their countries. <laughs> but the, <coughs> it was corrupted. Yeah. And uh, I, I had a chance to meet PLO leader Yasser mm. Arafat. Mm. So I have some, uh, the picture somewhere. But then they were corrupted and they didn't organize their government using the money coming from the West. Mm. And they eventually had an internal fight and has a Pata and then Hamas and then yeah. Islamic Jihad, the all kinds of you know, factions happened there and couldn't get their act together to make a strong country mm -hmm. against Israel. Yeah, that's true. So it was, I think they are, um, I know that there are the problems on both sides, but it's very difficult to condone the Palestinian side because uh, they didn't use their time very wisely. Yeah. I'm sad about that. So same in this country. In this country, we have uh, good people, good money, and everything. But then, this, the corruption on the you know, left wing side is severe. <laughs> and I'm glad that Dr. Lee and we are on the same side. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we are on the right side of history. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I appreciate Dr. Lee came <laughs> and gave us good lecture. And then we hope to see him again. And. Uh, Sorry that uh, when he talks in other places, the place is packed. But I don't know, no problem. <laughs> this is more precious than uh, but the then, quality is far more important than the quantity. <laughs> but at least we have one weapon uh, that uh, young is. So, <laughs> <laughs> so let's uh, thank uh, Dr. Lee. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for inviting me. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. We'll <laughs> uh, I'm going to attend some time later. So, all right. Let's enjoy the rest of the day. Let's enjoy the rest of the day. And uh, it's a good season. So enjoy the fall time. And uh, we'll, let's pray. We had a prayer time. Uh, Israel already left. Uh, but let's pray together. Uh, <clears throat> At the end of the service, all the late, uh, men uh, prayed. So I want this time the ladies come and pray. Ellen, Sarah, Youngy, all come to pray. Uh, <clears throat> I have a peace in my house through submission. So please. Christina, please come and pray here in Korean. Um, Aubrey, please come. Aubrey, do Aubrey, 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 Aubrey,
Krishna, please come. <laughs> okay. I wanted to pray for the people in Ukraine, Ukraine and uh, Palestine. You in Ukraine, you in Israel, you in Palestine. People pray for the people and peace for the countries. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are the God of peace and that you work in the hearts, minds, and lives of those people that love you. And we know that there are many um, Ukrainian believers, and Lord, we pray that they would um, heal and have your peace today, even in the midst of the war that is going on. Lord, we pray for um, your love and comfort for the families that have been impacted through the loss of the death of a loved one in Ukraine oh, yeah. in the last two years um, while the fighting has been going on. We pray that uh, your people would be your hands and feet of love um, to those families, those individuals, that there, this would be a time where if they did not know you, Lord, that they would come to know you, come to know you and feel your strength and love and power in the midst of, of this war. Lord, we pray for peace. We pray for peace in that place um, between those two countries that are at war, Lord. We pray that you would work and move, that you would have your people in places, that they would have the ear of those that have power to make decisions that impact the two countries, Amen. that they would listen yes. to wise words of peace, that Amen. peace could come and come quickly, and that the war would not Amen. continue on endlessly, Lord. Amen. We pray that you would hold back the evil, hold back the those in power that are greedy for um, ill-gotten gains through heavy war. And we pray, Lord, again, just that your hands, your feet, your work, um, that your peace would permeate that place. We do thank you, Lord, for the countries, the neighboring countries, and uh, Christian organizations that are reaching out to especially the women and children that are refugees and in many different countries along the borders. Lord, we thank you for them. We pray that you would provide for their needs, that your gospel would be shared, that these organizations, the individuals working there, the Christians, that they'd be sharing your love just practically Amen. and providing needs and resources to their women and children, as well as your gospel, Lord, that they can find the true hope that comes through you, the true peace that comes through knowing you in our relationship. And Lord, we just pray, we pray and ask, Lord, that an end would come to the war and your peace would reign in that place, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Lord, we continue to pray for um, those in Israel thousands of years ago, through David, you said to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, and that's needed as much today as it was then. Lord, uh, as we prayed in the Lord's Prayer, deliver us from evil. And Amen. Lord, we pray for deliverance from evil mm. uh, in this country. Lord, there are those who know you as Messiah and many who don't. But Lord, even as troops gather and they recite the Shema, or they mm. read the Psalms before they go into battle, Lord, may the truth and the reality that you are the God of Israel, Amen. that you want to be the Lord of their lives as well, that, that your word would speak into their hearts. Lord, we pray for the innocent to be rescued, for the hostages. Amen. Uh, we think especially of those little children mm. who are held. Um, Lord, may they be returned home to their families. Um, and Lord, that you would protect them and bring them home. Lord, we pray for uh, the ongoing battle that many are going to be lost, innocent, as well as uh, the enemy that does need to be destroyed. Lord, you are sovereign, and we Amen. trust your sovereignty to be in control of the events. It didn't take you by surprise, and it's all part of your timing and your plan. So, Lord, we ask that you would move mightily and work miraculously, even now, in, your, in this, your land. Amen. Amen. Dear Lord in heaven, 
We praise you, God. You are truly omnipotent and all-powerful. Amen. Even though we don't see an end to this conflict and it seems that war will only get worse, Lord, we know that you are in control and that you know exactly what will happen even as you wage war. God, we ask that you be with the Palestinians, Lord, the civilians who are caught in this conflict and have no say with their government, Lord. They are suffering as much as the other innocents in Israel. God, there are people who simply seek that peace, who want to be free, and God, we ask that you be with them and that you protect them, God. And Lord, we pray for our enemy as well, mm. because God, we know that you change the hearts of men. And as Hamas and as others attack the innocents, Lord, we ask that you change them, because there have been those who have turned away and have recognized the evil that is there. And so, God, that we ask that you take control of these people and that you change them, Lord, and that you bring a quick and swift end to this conflict and that peace be sought amongst Amen. people. Amen. Lord, we thank you for your control and we praise you, God. Jesus. We Amen. pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. And uh, have a good day. Thank <laughs> you.